1969, Lockheed was tasked by the US Air Force to design a plane that was so big that it could carry 3,000 troops, launch 22 parasite air-to-air -air jet fighters, and fly for 41 days straight without landing. But this design would never see the light of day. Facing design challenges such as building a powerful enough nuclear reactor to how to even take off into the sky. Designed by Lockheed to find the upper size limit of an aircraft using conventional 1969 materials and technology, this is the CL-1201, the biggest aircraft never built. The world of the late 60s was certainly an interesting one, right in the middle of the Cold War and with an America that faced enemies across the globe. The Department of Defense believed that there was a small chance that the USA would become isolated from its allies and cut off from its overseas bases. Thus, the leaders that be needed a solution that could project an entire US Army Brigade slice abroad, especially to landlock areas of the globe that were out of reach from the US's many carrier groups. Highly mobile joint task forces comprised of Army and Air Force units to move rapidly to objective areas and accomplish the mission. The solution would be an aircraft. While the Boeing 747 had just taken flight was considered for the Air Force as a flying aircraft platform, Lockheed was put onto track to develop something even more gargantuan, a giant city-sized flying aircraft carrier. The top secret project would be dubbed the CL-1201 based on the aerodynamic research of a previous project called the CL-1170, but with an extensively increased dimension. The airframe would measure a wingspan of 1,120 feet and be 560 feet long, giving the fuselage an interior space of 2 million cubic feet. A plane whose wingspan was 45 feet wider than the Chrysler building in New York is tall. As for how much this plane could carry, the figure was set around 10 million to 12 million pounds, or 5.4 thousand tons, a figure that was ballparked only by the engineers because Lockheed couldn't figure out why anyone would need to carry any more weight than that. For such a huge plane, conventional fuel wouldn't cut it. This sucker would be nuclear powered, with a reactor system giving out a combined 1.83 gigawatts, allowing this plane to fly for 41 days straight at Mach 0.8 over 16,000 feet, only having to land because the crew would run out of food and water a crew complement that on the bottom side of the scale would number 475 but may go up to 800 during an active combat zone, all needed to keep this plane flying and in operations 24-7. The reactor itself wouldn't need to be refueled for over 1,000 operation hours. Because of this, the plane wouldn't have any range limitations and could fly anywhere in the world. Well, apart from where it could possibly land, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. You see, there were actually two versions of this plane, the CL-1201-1-1 and the CL-1201-1-3. There was also technically a mystery-2 version, but all information about that has been scrubbed. But bear with me and we'll get back to that model later. The first version, the CL-1201-1, was dubbed the Attack Aircraft Carrier. It would carry 11 fighter bombers under each wing and two more in the fuselage hangars, for a total of 24 aircraft on board. While we don't know what these final mini-jets would have been like, in the documents that we have perused, they are listed as the F-4 Phantom. 
The idea was that this plane would serve as the spearhead at the start of an invasion or military power projection, and would be the command center for any military operation. The plane would also carry 10 long-range attack missiles, with Lockheed not ruling out that their warheads would be nuclear-tipped. This plane would never land in enemy territory, simply circling the battlefield at 30,000 feet and around 600 miles away. As for going deep behind enemy lines, that was up to the CL-1201-3, or dubbed the Logistical Support Aircraft or LSA. The LSA would be the carrier for the bulk of the mission, bringing drop troops and other equipment to the theater of war. It would carry 400 ground troops and 1,150 tons of cargo. But you might be wondering, how did the LSA deploy these troops? Well, that's the job of the equally ridiculous medium intra-theater transport plane converted Boeing 707s that would fly troops and materials back and forth from the LSA and to the battlefield. The LSA would have a fleet of five 707 MITs that would physically dock three at a time to the LSA whilst in flight. The planes would approach from the rear and connect to the back of the plane, powering down their engines and opening up their nose through a special pressurized airlock. These planes would then fly troops and gear to the drop zones for either paratrooper operations or landing at friendly or captured airports. In addition to the 400 troops and equipment on board the LSA, there would also be 150 troops on each MIT to a combined force of 1,150 troops in the entire mini fleet. But these aircraft wouldn't actually operate on their own. You see, it would be a fleet group of a single attack aircraft carrier and seven, yes, that's right, seven, logistical support aircraft. Because the fleet would be flying for 41 days straight, each plane had six decks for crew sleeping, recreation, mess halls, strategic command, and much more, not including the vast cargo bay, which was 22 times bigger than the Anatov 225. During deployment and flight, any operations to move equipment around would need to be coordinated to prevent the center of gravity shifting too much. In total, the combined fleet would carry 3,896 ground troops, 6,207 tons of equipment, 30 days of food and water, artillery, light aircraft, and even attack helicopters. Enough for a complete invasion of almost any country in the world. While such an awesome projection of power would be invaluable for the surrounded United States, there were several major flaws with the design. First of all, we have to address the elephant in the room. How on earth would this gigantic aircraft even take to the skies? After all, with a wingspan so wide and 8 feet wide wheels approximately 200 meters along the wing, the runway itself would need to be easily 650 feet across, let alone kilometers long to even let this plane get up to speed. No such runway exists, and several would need to be built for the extra capability for worldwide operations. But designers thought of this and came up with, honestly, a pretty ingenious solution. For you see, the aircraft wouldn't take off from a runway at all. It would fly vertically, like a Harrier jet. The LSA would use 54 of the recently developed turbojet engines that have been used on the Boeing 747 to provide over 82,000 pounds of thrust. The aircraft attack version would need a staggering 182 turbojets to provide the same vertical lift. Each engine would be in clusters of 20 throughout the plane and would run off conventional jet fuel. But you might be asking why? If this plane was designed to fly from the continental United States to take on enemies abroad and never land, then why give it the ability to land vertically at all? 
Above 16,000 feet, the four massive turbojet engines, each with a diameter of a Boeing 747, would power up with the tips going supersonic. If they rotated at 2,000 rotations per minute, the tips would be moving at over 4,000 feet per second. The definition of hypersonic. Such engine technology is almost beyond today's level of technology and would have been an impressive feat for designers back in 1969. To power all of these engines, the CL-1201 would have a nuclear fission reactor that would provide 1.83 gigawatts for all operations on board. Although the plane would also have a small fuel compartment as a backup and to assure that the VTOL capacity worked when needed. To keep the crew safe from radiation during the flight from the reactor, the 30-foot wide reactor core would have a 20-foot wall of radiation protection adding to the enormous weight of the aircraft. And to keep the reactor cool, liquid metal would transport the heat to the exterior of the plane, touching the super cool air outside. To prevent radioactive material spilling out during a crash, the reactor was designed to shut down within 20 seconds and could survive a head-on impact with a mountain traveling at 600 miles per hour without breaking apart. Speaking of impact, the designers also realized that it would be susceptible to missile attacks. The solution was laser cannons and laser point defense systems to blow any missiles out of the sky before they reached this giant plane. But as we don't have many lasers in use today, you can see how this idea would have gone. In the end, the CL-1201 project didn't get any further thanks to the enormous cost, and what could have been has now faded into history. But maybe, and this is the crazy part, maybe it actually was built. That's right, it's time to pull out the tinfoil and believe in something so crazy sounding that maybe there's a nugget of truth. In March of 1997, there was a series of widely sighted UFO objects across Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico dubbed the Phoenix Lights. Witnesses described the object as a giant flying V that was bigger than a 747 and sounded like the gushing wind. Despite being nighttime, witnesses saw several lights like those found on aircraft blinking in the darkness, and the object was so huge that it visibly hid the stars in the sky. UFO experts suggested that this object would have been at least a mile wide and fits the description of the CL-1201 pretty well. After all, they never did reveal what the second version of the plane was designed for. A Phoenix City Councilwoman launched an investigation into this event and said that of over the 700 witnesses she interviewed about the lights, the government never interviewed even one. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We've gone in a bit of a different direction with this video today, but I think it's something that fits the bill for an incredible never built aircraft. This video topic was actually suggested by one of our Patreons on our channel. So if you're interested in choosing with what comes next and having a chat with other Patreon members, then I suggest you head over to the link in the description. And if you wanna see the full 3D model used in this video, and discover more about this project, then go to foundandexplained.com, our website where we add extra bits of trivia that didn't make it to the final cut, absolutely free. And if you enjoyed today's video, then consider subscribing to our channel. It's free and you can cancel at any time. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.